Rejection and pain offer us a turning point, a pivot point for our lives. Will we choose to grow with God or build a home in our hurt and in our hatred? We're in a series right now called Turning Points. And a turning point that we routinely encounter in our lives is pain, rejection, isolation. Even this week on our five-day-a-week prayer line, 6 a.m., we are crying out to the Lord, and God, God's answering. A woman on the line this week paused our prayer meeting and says, I've got I've to tell you all about something. She says, I'm an artist, but as a kid, I was practicing my art and getting really serious about it in my teenage years, and my father said a disparaging word about my art. He implied that I'll never make money on it. And from that moment, I've had a fraught relationship with my artwork and with my dad. And today, on my father's four-year anniversary after he died, I'm here to say, God, I'm sorry for holding this against him. And I reached out to her this week and said, could I share this turning point that you've experienced of forgiveness and, and letting, releasing this anxiety and this pain towards your, your dad? And she said, absolutely, please share it. Also, I've been sitting down at my desk and drawing again, and it's becoming more easy than ever. Will we choose to build a home in our pain? and in our hurts? Or will we choose God's invitation to growth? Turning points. The context of the word that we're going to today is in the context of all of our scripture. Last week, we looked at how things break and how things fall apart from Genesis chapter 3. It's right at the very start of our Bibles, and it offers us a context for the Bible, but also the world that we live in today. It's broken, and we saw immediately how all of these relationships that God built around the, his first people began to break. It started with a relationship with God, broken relationship with one another, broken relationship even with their own body and their self and their, creative, their creativity, broken. And there was no repentance, no turning back to God, no taking responsibility. And so rather than having a new beginning, which is what today's scripture is supposed to be about, what we find is a new breaking, a new fall. Deep down in the very center of our brain, there is this control center that we have little, little control over. It controls us more than we control it. It's, I think it's called the amygdala, and somebody in neurobiology can correct me after the service, be like, actually, you know, that's what they say, but. And deep, deep down in there is our fight or flight response, right? Who, who, who here is a fighter? Who's a fighter? I'm a fighter. <laughs> when I get scared, like, just like fists start to legs, and I'm not very good at fighting, but it just starts to happen, you know? Uh, <laughs> it's gotten me in trouble, man. <laughs> One of my best friends, like, we're hiding behind the corner, and he, and he had this bullhorn, and he, yelled, he just yelled at me, and it freaked me out, and I just stood there, and I was like, ah! And the only way I could get rid of the tension was then to just punch him. It was like five-second delay. I don't fare well, like my amygdala is not actually helping me survive anything, it's just helping me pick fights after the fact, after I would have already died, you know? Post-mortem fighting, probably not the best. Dawkins would have something to say about that, I'm sure. But um, in any case, deep down in there, we have the fight or flight response. And Adam and Eve, when they were supposed to flee from the snake, they instead fled from God. And today, we're gonna see what happens when you're supposed to fight the snake and instead you fight your brother. And last week it opened up what was called the cycle of shame, the cycle of shame, the shame cycle. And this week we're gonna open up the pain cycle of rejection <laughs> and see how if you don't respond to your world with shame, that's not a very American response, in fact. It's, Americans, we love to fight, we love to rebel, we love our guns, we love our freedoms and our independences. And so instead of a shame cycle, most of us would probably, at least if you're from the U.S., maybe relate a bit better as a whole, I'm making generalizations, to the rejection cycle. In any case, the good news is we don't have to stay there. God comes in and starts to break the cycle. 
So let's pick up our, our Bibles to Genesis chapter 4, where we see a story that's very similar to the story that we looked at last week, but with a twist. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1 through 5. Now Adam and Eve, excuse me, Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of God. Now, last week we looked at how God promised that through the woman was going to come one to redeem. And she's thinking, here he is, my firstborn son. I've just endured labor. I've just gone through that. I got to see that, you know, firsthand a couple of times. And uh, that's traumatic, you know. So she's just gone through all of that. She didn't have a mom. She didn't know what that looked like. She didn't have a sister to watch and help with. So she's just gone through the most traumatic thing in her life. She came out on the other side to her own shock and surprise alive. And she's like, I've done it. I've borne the one that's going to save me. And she heaps all of her expectations onto her child. No parent has ever done that ever since. No, no parent has ever broken that cycle of heaping all of their expectations onto their child more than they can bear. <laughs> oh, God, help us. So all of these expectations are laid on Cain. You can kind of hear it in the word. I've gotten a man. I've gotten the one that's going to help me. Oh, yeah, thanks to God. Her hope, her expectations are pinned on the wrong one. God has helped me get this man that's going to help me. Again, that prayer has never been prayed. God, help me get a man or a woman that's going to save me. Make me know that I'm truly loved and beautiful and helpful and everything else. All right, you can see that this story, even if you don't believe it's true, it's true. It rings so true to our human nature. And I said this last week, you don't have to believe that this is historical reality in order to receive Jesus, who is a historical reality, into your life. It's only through Jesus that I began to believe that this is historical reality. As I got to know him, he led me back to these and taught me how he reads them, and I began to see these in a new light. But if you're not ready for that, that's fine. That's fine. Don't throw the truth out with the history. Don't do that. It's okay. It's okay. I, I'll allow it. Somebody, there's probably a good old Christian that's offended by me saying that. But that's okay. I'm not, I'm not here for them. They're already on home team. I'm here for, if you don't know Jesus, if you don't believe in the Bible just yet, I'm here for you. All right? And by God's grace, also, you also can break the cycle of rejection or shame that is present in everybody's life. You can see it in Eve, you can see it in your mom and dad, you can see it, if you're honest, in your life. You can see it. So Adam and Eve, they make this baby, they heap all their expectations on him, and again she bore his brother, Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. And in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering, a fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel's offering, but of Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. So we encounter these offerings that these men are bringing to the Lord. And scholars believe that what they were doing was going outside of the gates of the Garden of Eden, back to where they knew the presence of God was, back to where their family had told these stories of, man, we were in the garden, it was so beautiful. If only we could get back there. And they were offering sacrifices to the Lord saying, God, would you connect heaven and earth again? Would you give us the, the hopes and the dreams of our family again? God, would you restore the way that things used to be? God, would you bring the good life here and now? And whether you believe in God or not, we all make sacrifices unto the good life. If you've graduated from high school, you made sacrifices to the good life. If you graduated from college, you've made sacrifices to the good life. If you've worked a career and you've worked yourself down to the ground, you've made sacrifices now so that by some <coughs> effort, your future might be brighter. We sacrifice now for a brighter tomorrow. Sacrifice is the ritual of faith where, we, where our assertions become actions. We put actions behind our words. We sacrifice for your hopes and our dreams, and this is exactly how Cain and Abel are doing this. Cain offered generously, piously, and regularly, I believe regularly, to the Lord. Cain put it out there. And maybe because he was the older brother, he brought along his snot-nosed little kid brother 
And he started watching and was like, okay, this is what we do. Cain's out there working hard, gathering up his fruit. And remember, there's no plan B. Like, if you run out of fruit, if you run out of sheep, you're dead. That's it. There's no, you know, stealing something off of somebody else's table. There's nobody else to fall back on. It's you, it's your family, and that is it. And so they're taking of their hard-earned stuff, bringing it to the Lord and saying, God, would you honor us? Would you visit with us? Would you bless us? Would you let us back into the abundance, the infinite nature of you? God, we're looking past what we have into what you have. Lord, would you open up the heavens for us? Like what Anne Marie was talking about just earlier. And God does it. The limitless God visits them. But he doesn't visit Cain. He visits the little snotty kid, Abel. The one that just, just started coming along, that watched his brother and said, yeah, I'll do that too. God visited that kid who offered sacrifices after Abel. This is not about does God like meat or veggies. This is not what this is about. And there are hints and clues that could point to Abel's offering being a better offering than Cain's. But whether Abel offered a better offering or the lamb was particularly well barbecued that day or, or whatever the case may have been, when we are received by God, it is always a work of God's grace. You can't earn your way in. You can't buy your way into God's good graces. He is infinite. You're limited. He is omniscient. You are... Uh, uh... It's okay. We're all in it together. We're all dumb together. Like, we, we make bad gods. That's what this whole, book is, this, this whole book is about, just how bad of gods we make and how we need a God that actually knows up to come and help us out. So Abel's received and accepted by God out of the good graces of God. Yes, we could look at Abel's offering being better in certain ways, but ultimately God gave Abel the faith to even offer a better offering. It came from God. It was God's idea, and God honored Cain. It's by sheer grace that Abel was accepted. Just the gifts of God. And it wasn't fair. Cain was like, I'm the firstborn. I did this first. It was my idea. One, one could read that in. <laughs> Why wasn't it me? Why not me? And he's angry. He's angry at his brother for following him there that day. He's angry at God for not honoring him. He's angry. Growing up in my church, there was a saying in my, my church, and because my church was led by my dad, then all of the churches came home with us as well, and so it was also in my home as well. And my dad would say this, favor ain't fair. Favor ain't fair. And you know, we'd normally say it when we sat down to a big meal or, or somehow we got a new car, somebody would give us a new car, and you'd just go, man, favor ain't fair. And I was like, yeah, this rocks. Favor's not fair. Favor's not fair is fun to say when favor's coming your way. Yes. <laughs> but when favor lands on the person that did less, did it last, didn't do it well, which is not Abel's case, but man, favor can fall wherever God chooses to show favor, and that's the nature of his favor. You couldn't earn it anyways. You're going to need some, uh, some, some help. And so God choosing to give somebody else help and, and saying you're going to need to wait for just another moment can feel crushing. Rather than celebrating his little brother, getting this encounter with God where he got blessed beyond all wildest measure. And you can say, where, where do you see the blessing in the text? Here's what I know. Whatever Cain saw Abel get, was worth killing for, whatever that is. Wherever you reach your murder point, it's that, okay? Like, man, I'd kill to have those shoes. Okay, maybe it's there, or maybe it's something a little bit more than shoes, right? But we also know people have lost their lives over shoes, so this is real, real stuff, real talk. The late um, Tim Keller told a story of a woman who realized the grace of God and how she needed God's grace for salvation and how it was so scary to her. So this is a pastor that was ministering in New York City. He recently went to be with the Lord. 
And this woman came, salvation is so, by grace is so scary. And he said, tell me more about that. She said, well, if, if you're saved by works, then there's a limit to what God can ask of you. It's like you're a tax player and you've paid your dues and he can ask you of certain things of you, but not anything. But if I'm really saved by grace, because of what Jesus has done, then there's no limit to what he can ask of me. And my obedience would have to be unconditional. I think Abel saw a bit of the grace of God. And he said, God, because of how great you are, because of how you've loved me, because of how you've shown my family not punishment but grace and mercy, God, have it all. I'm going to sacrifice to you before all of the lambs are born. I'm going to give you the best. I'm going to give you the first. I've seen your grace. My offerings are unconditional to you. He saw the grace. The righteousness that we have gives us no rights before our God. Our sacrifices give us no rights before God. And here's the twist. Our pain, our rejection, it gives us no rights before God. And we want rights. Cain wanted to go first. As an older brother, personally, I've got three younger brothers and two younger sisters. I'm like, me first. I'm going to cut to the front of the line. As a father now, my kids get the food. I'm like, hey, that looks good. Before we say the prayer, the fork comes out and the daddy tax comes in. Shonk, thank you very much. <laughs> Me first. I paid for it all anyways. You know, you get all your self-righteousness on. I'm the oldest. I'm the, oh, God, help me. Help us. <laughs> thank you. I knew there was at least one brother out there that knew I was talking about more than just me. Thank you. God, help us. The pain of that moment caught Cain out. And pain can catch all of us out. We often take pain as a right to our sin, a right to be a jerk, a right to reject first. Man, somebody's hurt me. You don't get me. You don't understand me. You don't know what it's like to walk a day in my shoes. So therefore, I don't have to risk anymore. I don't have to give anymore. I don't have to let you in. I don't have to love again. I don't have to settle down in a church. I'm going to keep it moving. I have the rights because of my pain, because of my past, regardless of our pain's origin, whether it's from God whether our pain was from our own stupidity or even someone's abuse toward you. The question is, how will you respond? Rejection and pain offers us a turning point. Will we choose to grow with God or build a home in our hatred? It offers us a turning point. What you say and think about others is less a reflection of them and more a reflection of your heart. How are you responding to the pain in your life? Matthew chapter 5, Jesus takes the issue of murder and he turns it inward. He says, this is not about just what you do with your hands. This is about what you do with your heart and with your words. He says, you've heard it said, and it was said of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders is liable of judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable of judgment. And whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable of the hell of fire. If you've ever looked across your social media and said, you idiot, don't you know? Wouldn't you do better if? Oh, look out. And that's why I came off of social media is because I saw my heart getting twisted and I said, God, this is more about my heart than those idiots on the other side of my screen. Look out, I'm the one that called them idiots. That says more about me than them. So I said, okay, I need to watch what I watch because this is more about my heart than their heart. I need to watch what I'm thinking because it's more about my mouth than their mouth. I am not responsible for them. I'm responsible for me and God is interested in me. This is something that we tell our children all the time. Forget about your brother. Forget about your sister. This is about you. And God's saying the same thing to each of us. Forget about Cain, Abel. You do your thing. I've called you to serve me. 
Abel, I mean, excuse me, Cain, forget about your little brother. I've called you to serve me. <clears throat> and sure enough, God comes after Abel. Abel's mad. Uh, excuse me, Cain's mad, and God comes after him. The story goes on. Genesis chapter 4, 6 through 8. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you so angry? Why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? Notice God's not angry. God's not preaching at him. God is asking him questions. And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at your door, and its desire is contrary to you. But you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. Cain invited his brother, said, hey, brother, let's go for a walk. And they went, when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. God comes to Cain and says, Cain, there's this sin. There's this moral evil. And it's trying to kill you. It's telling you it's a friend. It's telling you if you just speak harshly against your brother, if you just rise up in your self-righteousness, if you just pet that thing like a, like a, like a pet, that it's going to treat you right. But that sin is not a friend. It's a foe. And you've got to fight your foe. You've got to rise up and fight it. Sin's at the door, which means that if you want your freedom, if you want to go in and out and live your life in freedom, then you need to rise up and kill that thing, just like I called your parents to rise up and kill that snake in the garden. Now, that there's, now there's a new snake, and it's not out there. It's in here. It's in your heart. That twisting has entered into your heart, and you're going to need to do some battle with it. It's lying to you. It's not your friend. You've got to fight it. Will we fight our sin? Will we walk in freedom? Will we walk in forgiveness? Will we choose the path that God has for us or will we choose the path of the thing that's really trying to kill us? Our foe, our sin. James chapter four says this, what causes quarrels and what causes fights amongst you? Is it not that your passions are at war within you? The things that you want, your heart. Is it not the things that are inside of you that's causing all of this fighting anyways? Your desires. You desire and you do not have, so you murder. Or you speak ill of somebody because you're not getting your way. You covet and you can't obtain. You fight and you quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask and you do not ask uh, and, and you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. What James is saying here is your heart is so twisted. You've made friends with the wrong things. You've not fought what's right and you've not befriended what's right. You've instead said, my desires are over my relationships. My desires are over even my relationship with God. So when I go to ask him and I don't get what I want, it's his fault, not my fault. Good. It's all twisted. It's all out of, of order. And what we enter into here is the rejection cycle, what I call the rejection cycle. And it starts by, with, with pain, a painful experience. And again, this could be from God. This could be from your own stupidity. It could be from somebody truly evil who's done something horrible to you. And here's the, the horrible nature of this is that there's no changing that. There's only changing you. How will we respond? Because pain can turn into a great growth engine in our lives, or it can turn into our prison cell. How will we respond? It starts with rejection, a painful experience that we internalize and identify it with, allowing that pain and that hurt and that hatred become our home. That leads us to rebellion, and we leave the path of God, and it's because my pain demands it. I have to, I have to honor my pain. I have to honor my sordid history. I need to do what feels right, what my desires are telling me to do. You see, God is gonna ask you to forgive. God's gonna ask you for healing and growth. But if you listen to that pain, if you listen to that new friend of yours, it's gonna say, no, do it your way. You're out for number one anyways. They're going to kill you. I'm going to save you. When actually the path of healing is not with your pain. It's with your God. Amen. Got South Africans in the room, so you, you, you got you to quote 
Oh, goodness. I need some water. <laughs> I've just gone off. You, you've got me distracted, bro. Shouldn't have gone off. Shouldn't have gone off peace. Forgot your first president. His name. Thank you, bro. It's so embarrassing. I'm thinking Robin, Robin, Robin Island, and and <laughs> got the history all up in my in my head, but I couldn't remember Nelson Mandela, who said unforgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping your enemy will die. It promises to be a friend. Your pain promises friendship. It promises salvation. It says, just drink the poison. They're going to die. Thank you. Nelson Mandela, how could I forget that? <laughs> Unforgiveness is like drinking poison and believing that your enemy is going to die. God's going to require forgiveness. But instead, when we've ingested that rejection, when we've made pain our home and our friend, then we would start to walk in rebellion. And finally, we live out that rebellion by controlling our environment and controlling our surroundings. It's expressed in full withdrawal from God. And rather than fighting our sin, we fight our friends. Yeah. And we fight our God. Yeah. And we don't allow them to help. And we control our environment to ensure that that pain that's happened to us before never happens again. And this is how, how hurt people hurt people. This is how... Children of alcoholic parents become alcoholic themselves. This is how children of abusive parents become abusive themselves. This horrible cycle of rejection and rebellion and control begins to tumble down, not just from our own life, but through generational lines. And God is here to break the cycle of generational pain. Amen. He's here to break this cycle. And so God steps in. How does God respond? Well, the first, then the Lord said to Cain in Genesis 4, 9, where's your brother Abel? Again, God knows where Abel is. God watched that whole thing go down. He comes to him again, not with a stick, not with abuse, not with words of hatred, with questions. Are you going to respond? God asked Adam and Eve, their parents, where are you? Now the question is expanded out. Where's your brother? He says, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? Again, the fourth question. And the voice of your brother, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Can you believe this? He has the audacity to speak back to God and say, hey, even though I put my brother in the ground, and now the ground is crying out, you murderous person, I want to be connected to the ground. I don't want to be a fugitive, even though he's broken relationships utterly. He's saying, hey, I don't. I don't want to be rejected from the ground. I don't want to be rejected from your sight. I don't want to be rejected from all of my relationships. That's more than I can bear, even though that's exactly what he earned. Again, how is God going to respond? I know how I do it. This is what the, the consequences of your actions, son. Take responsibility. Grow up. You killed your brother. Now you're going to die. Speaking as, I don't know, a human who's broken a father and a son who's broken. This is exactly what he deserves. Cain goes on, Behold, you've driven me today away from the ground and from your face. I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Whoever finds me is going to kill me. I'm like, yeah, like you deserve. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, which has been misinterpreted through history as some sort of bad blight on Cain. In fact, it's a mark of grace. It's a sign of God's covering. It's a good thing, not a bad thing. Don't get it twisted. Let any who find him, lest any who find him should attack him. So the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who find him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. 
in the face of our rebellion and our absolute rejection of God, the Lord is coming after us to break that cycle today with a pursuit. The way that God responds to the rejection cycle is the same way that God responds to the shame cycle that we looked at last week. God pursues. How does he pursue? The first thing he does is he warns. He says, hey, sin's crouching at the door. It's trying to kill you. It's going to offer you friendship. You need to kill it. You need to master it. You need to subdue it. He warns. Then he again asks questions. Why are you angry? Where is your brother? What have you done? In the face of our rejection, God brings honor. Honor, again, is holding someone in high esteem even when they fall short. Treating them the way that God sees them. Saying you're still made in the image of God. You're still loved of God. So in this moment, I want you to picture your worst enemy. That person is made in the same image as you. Amen. That person is just as deserving of the love of God as you are. Amen. Begins to soften and turn our heart. God honors Cain. And rather than letting him die like he deserves... He says, I'm going to protect you. And anybody that comes after you, I'm going to avenge you sevenfold. It's the number of completion saying, my protection is upon you. While you deserve to be cast out from my presence, I'm going to protect you anyways. Finally, in face of our control, God relinquishes all control and sacrifices and loves so generously. Today, I believe that there are people here that have felt and picked up rejection from God because God has withheld what you would call good, but here's the thing. God is withholding what you think of as good for your own protection and safety. Amen. For some of you, you've been believing for that career or that man or that woman or that child. Don't pick up rejection in that moment. I know it's painful. And in these moments of pain, we can choose to suffer with the creator of the universe or we can choose to suffer without him. Man, when the Lord took my brother, I saw before me a pivot point. Do I choose to suffer with the God that I believe took my brother or do I choose the cold, dark universe of pain and loneliness and wishing? can choose to suffer with God who has plan and has purpose even in your pain or you can choose to suffer without him. Choose God. Choose life. Choose grace. Choose the Lord who sacrificed for you, who we sometimes sing of his reckless love, who chose to give his one and only son so that you might live so that you could be accepted back into his good graces, so that you could come back into the place that Cain and Abel were trying to get into the very presence of God. Today, as we try to get back into the presence of God, as we try to create the good life here on earth, God is doing it on our behalf. And the author of Hebrews begins to describe what this is like in Hebrews chapter 12. He says this, and this is as I close. Um, For you have not come to what may be touched. He's saying you're not trying to get to the things that you know. It's not the career. It's not the man. It's not the woman. It's not the child. It's not the blessings here on earth that we're trying to touch. We're trying to reach for something beyond all of that. The good life that exists beyond all of that. In Hebrews 12, verse 18. And then he goes on to say in Hebrews 12, 22, referring to the same idea, but you've come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem and to immeasurable angels in festal gatherings and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enthroned in heaven and to God, the judge of all and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect and to Jesus. You're trying to get to this heavenly place. You're trying to see heaven on earth. You're trying to build a home of peace and prosperity here. But what we're trying to reach for can't be touched with human hands. 
And he's saying, you're now welcome to this Mount Zion. You're now welcome to watch angels and festal gatherings and to the saints of old worshiping God and to the collection of the firstborn, which we are adopted into through the blood of Jesus. And he says this, we're all welcome here because of Jesus. Welcome here because of Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant and to the sprinkled blood blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. While we've sinned and held our brothers to account and spoken violently against people, their blood cries out, you're guilty. You're guilty. Abel's blood cried out against Cain, guilty. He did it. He killed me. And today, Jesus' blood is speaking out a better word over our sin, over our shame, over our rejection, over our pain, over all of who we are, the blood of Jesus is speaking this word, forgiven, Amen. forgotten. Amen. It's gone. Yeah. They're clean, they're righteous, they're renewed, they're restored, they're brand new. The blood of Jesus today is speaking a better word over each of our lives, which is why we saying, I just wanna speak the name of Jesus. Jesus, thank you for forgiving us. Thank you, God, for redeeming us. Thank you, Lord, for restoring us. Thank you, God, for stepping in to bring us a love that cuts contrary to our rejection and our pain, that can break the cycle of pain, that can break generational curses and bondages today, that can step in and speak a brand new word where we don't even deserve it. Jesus, would your, your mighty name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross for our sins be present here today to bring us something new because you can fight and you can try and you can war against your desires all day long but often it just causes more pain Lord would you come with a brand new power the way that we respond to this God and see the cycle of shame and pain and rejection fully broken in our, in our lives as we respond to Jesus, his honor and his pursuit and his sacrifice, one, by walking in the same way towards our friends and family. We honor their, them. We cover their sin. We choose not to speak words of hatred and pain over them. We choose to pursue those relationships with forgiveness and love, and we choose to die to our own emotions in the process. We choose to walk the path of Jesus. Yes. And we respond to our God with security. Because he pursues us, we respond with security. Because he honors us, we respond with trust. And because he sacrificed his one and only son, we too surrender our lives to him. This is how we respond to God, how we break the cycle of rejection and pain in our life, and how we build a new legacy for us, for our home, for our family and our friends. God, would you do this today in us and through us? In Jesus' name, amen.